and along came a spider. Welcome to SETI Astro. So this particular object is kind of nestled between where Eagle and Omega are and uh, the Trifid and Lagoon Nebulas. So it's kind of, you know, halfway between those very popular targets. And this one intrigued me, very small size, which I thought would be perfect for trying to really push my imaging rig. And at the same time, I needed something kind of later in the night uh, because earlier in the night, we were doing some exoplanet hunting uh, with a different group. The other really big reason is there's almost no images of this thing on Astrobin at all. There's there's a couple, but the vast majority of you, you search NG6537 are just, you know, wide angle shots that happen to include it in the image. So getting a good image of this thing, I, I felt was, was a great goal and uh, something I could strive for here. So overall, I got just under 32 hours of exposure, all 15 minute sub exposures for hydrogen. I got 16 hours and then the other half was split between oxygen and sulfur, a little bit more on the oxygen filter than the, than the sulfur, but here's the, the linear data. And you could see even in hydrogen, the central core is just really, really, really bright for this. The other thing that's really nice about hydrogen is there's all this other nebulosity throughout it, which, which is great. You've got this little spider here nestled in and amongst a lot of other emission. Doing the normal steps, sharpening, denoising, removing the stars. Uh, this is the, the hydrogen in full and zooming down in on the, the spider. You can really see a lot of the additional details. Hydrogen really brings a lot. There's a lot of structure in these streams coming off. For oxygen, you can see the, the image is almost completely devoid of oxygen, with the exception of the spider way down in the center here. And in oxygen, the central core is much dimmer. And going through the, the same processing steps on hydrogen, you can see the oxygen here just has some sharply defined features jets coming off of it and then for sulfur very similar story pretty much the entire image is devoid of sulfur with the exception of the spider down in here and its core is even dimmer in the sulfur regime which actually is going to be very beneficial later in processing and doing the same pre-processing steps here's the sulfur there's more items in the, the sulfur area than oxygen but way less than than in hydrogen What's great about the sulfur, as I was saying, is if you just do a light stretch on the linear data, you can get the central structure of the spider nebula here, which we'll be able to utilize to fold that structure back into the image towards the end. So we can actually get some of that without having a completely blown out core. And we're gonna see that this central structure in here, this, this torus shape is also very visible in the professional equipment and some really cool scientific papers on this object. I did create uh, two palettes for this. One is the very unconventional OSS palette. And I figured this would be really good, again, for structure deep down in the Red Spider Nebula because it is using the, the dimmer channels and being able to fold some of that structure back into the, the really bright core of the hydrogen. So I, I do have the, the OSS palette. And then I also made a Forex palette. I'm a big fan of Forex palette for SHO data, especially something like this where hydrogen is completely dominant. If we went with the standard Hubble palette, it would just be a huge green mess. It, it would just be a nightmare to deal with. So looking in close, just the raw Forex palette. And then it's a matter of, you know, highlighting what you want in an image. The other thing I did was utilize the Wavescale HDR in City Astro Suite to do some items inside the core here. And then I was able to take this image and make a really tiny mask and layer that directly into the starless image here with just a little bit of luminosity. So I was able to kind of retain that. I mean, it's extremely bright still, 
but there is the, the ring in here in the, in the central structure itself. As for the stars, I use my narrowband RGB star combination tool. I think, once again, it just, it just does what it's supposed to do and makes you pretty stars out of your, your narrowband stars. And now, combining all of it together, we have our final uh, red spider nebula here with just little pockets of probably past blow-offs of material from this system. But let's, let's talk about this system and, and what the heck are we even looking at here? So this was the image taken with the new technology telescope at La Silla. It's a 3.6 meter class Ritchie Crichton scope. So a lot more, a lot more resolution than, than my 10 inch newt, but this is what it was able to capture. There's the ring structure down in the, the core as well. Again, extremely bright, but we could actually star align these two images and, and really, really see the comparison between the two. So here's the two images at, at the same exact scale. Obviously there's going to be more resolution on the, on the big scope, right? But we can overlay them now directly and see that these structures that we're seeing in here, these, these weird blobby things, the central core ring, you know, all, all this stuff, that's, it's true structure. And then the extent of these arms and gas that goes out from the actual spider nebula just isn't really captured in the the big scope here at all and here you can kind of see the the overlay of both of them and then here's mine so all that is real structure that's really in there it's seen in the professional telescope as well which is really cool to see that those those blob shapes are they're real, they're, they're real wave structures coming off from the, the central portion of the, the planetary nebula. So this is actually a paper done on the Red Spider Nebula. It has data from Hubble and the Very Large Telescope. And it is just a wealth of really cool knowledge. A lot of very detailed images, even really far into the core where they can see the central white dwarf star and they, they go in and, and talk about a, a lot of this. And one of the, the biggest thing here is the amount of dust around it. So the dust around it is extremely bright and they go into it down, down in here. The dust itself essentially has an effective temperature of somewhere between 32 and 45,000 Kelvin, which is crazy hot. <laughs> That's... You know, for, for comparison, our sun, the, the, the surface of the sun is like 6,000 Kelvin, right? So this is, the, 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 the dust shell itself is, is ridiculously hot. That's why it's so crazy bright. You know, it, it, it's more luminous than our sun because of all this heat. And with that, they're able to really estimate the temperature of the central white dwarf. And the temperatures of the central white dwarf are just insane. They're talking about temperatures with the upper end of 500,000 Kelvin for the temperature of the white dwarf. And they do say there's other models that are showing it at like 340,000 Kelvin, but it does say that the models tend to, to track with the, the, the higher mass and the higher temperature, which in my mind is just an insane amount of temperature. That's half a million Kelvin. And then they go into further things about you know, is, is there a, a secondary companion somewhere in this crazy mix-up of swirling gases and stuff? They, they honestly can't make that determination in, in this study either. There, there's just so much dust going on. So it's still a completely open question whether there's a companion somewhere in there, which is leading to, you know, just this big swirling mass of stuff, or whether it's just like two lobes and it's spinning, you know, there's just a lot of unknowns with this with this object. And I think that's really cool. Um, I think there's a lot of really cool science going on in this. And again, this is a, one of the hottest white dwarfs that we've ever measured, potentially going up to half a million Kelvin and the dust shell inside there alone is pretty much just evaporated dust. Like no, nothing can really survive that high of a heat. So that it's just a glowing, donut from hell I guess I don't I don't know but it, it's, it's just really cool I've updated Astrobin with my red spider nebula and along came a spider I have the mouse over starless version of it 
I have all my acquisition details here. I do have the full uncropped view as well. A little write-up. I have a little GIF of the comparison between the new technology telescope and the data I acquired. Some close and crops of that S2 data and the OSS structure. And I don't know if I really mentioned it, but this thing is this thing is small. So the, the bright central core area of it is only like 45 by 50 arc seconds, making this uh, bright central piece here, you know, roughly the size of Jupiter in the sky, right? Jupiter is about an arc minute in diameter. And then the, the full extent, the, the whole width of this thing is, is right at a, about four arc minutes. So it, it's not a big object at all. If you're going to go chase after it, I would recommend, you know, at, at least like my setup, a, a thousand millimeter focal length, so you can get some, so you can get some actual pixels across this thing uh, for for the imaging. I've also updated my website, setastro.com, with and along came a spider. I have a slider for the starless and starry views of the nebula, along with the the same write up, a linked astro bin, the animation, S2 and OSS versions, and the the scale of the actual object down in there. Well, I hope this gets you guys excited as we leave galaxy season and move back into some awesome nebula within the, the galactic plane. Please comment, like, and subscribe.